Então, bom dia a todos, um prazer tê-los novamente, né? vamos caminhando aqui para o nosso último dia de evento. Eu vou fazer a apresentação do nosso palestrante de hoje, professor Geilson Loureiro. O Geilson Loureiro ele é graduado em Engenharia Eletrônica pelo ITA e é PhD em Engenharia de Sistemas pela Universidade de Loughborough. Ele fez pós-doutorado no tema Sistemas de Sistemas na Exploração Espacial, no MIT, em 2004, e outro pós-doutorado em Desenvolvimento de Cube na Universidade de Würzburg, em 2011, na Alemanha. Gilson Loureiro é diretor do LIT, Laboratório de Integração e Teste do INPE, desde 2013. E ele é professor de Engenharia de Sistemas no Programa de Pós-Graduação em Gerenciamento e Engenharia de Sistemas Espaciais do INPE. Gilson trabalha no INPE desde 1988, tendo participado em muitos processos de ciclo de vida de desenvolvimento de satélites, da concepção ao lançamento. Gilson foi o primeiro presidente do INCOSE Brasil. Gilson, gostaria muito de agradecer a sua participação, agradecer por você ter aceitado o nosso convite e palestrar no UER. O título da palestra do professor Gilson é Systems Engineering as a Requirement Engineering Verification and Validation Discipline. Então, Gilson, a palavra, a palavra está com você, por favor, pode dar início. Obrigado, Luiz, pela introdução. Também gostaria de agradecer ao professor Paulo Lourenção, que me fez a ponte, né, fez o contato, para que eu pudesse ser convidado para essa palestra. É, provavelmente essa palestra é a última que eu dou como chefe do LIT, porque está havendo uma mudança organizacional no INC, e provavelmente essa posição... É, será ocupada por outra pessoa. É, mas é um grande prazer falar sobre esse tema. É, eu tenho trabalhado com engenharia de sistemas desde 1994, quando eu fui fazer o doutorado na Inglaterra. E eu não sabia, né, que era engenharia de sistemas com o que eu queria trabalhar. Na época, a gente tinha um problema. Eu entrei no INPE trabalhando em em manufatura, manufatura eletrônica de satélites. Na época, o INPE fazia a fabricação das placas eletrônicas de satélites. E a gente encontrava uma série de problemas durante a manufatura que eram relacionadas ao projeto. Então, por exemplo, eu tinha um distanciamento entre ilhas para colocar um componente, um resistor, por exemplo, numa placa eletrônica, e o tamanho do resistor era era maior do que o espaçamento entre as ilhas, era incompatível. Então, haveria necessidade ainda de fazer um esforço de engenharia para colo colocar aquele, aquele componente, por exemplo, em outra posição na placa. Só que, por exemplo, quando você coloca um, um componente, ao invés de colocar deitado, colocar em pé numa placa eletrônica, no caso espacial, você tem problemas, porque o centro de massa dele vai ficar acima, e na vibração ele pode não passar no teste. E aí o que você tem que fazer? Você tem que é, encapsular a placa com, uh, com formal coating. Isso aumenta a massa. Isso afeta o preço, o custo do lançamento e o custo do ciclo de vida como um todo. Então eu me deparei naquela época com problemas que tinham a ver com requisitos dos processos de ciclo de vida. Eu fui ao ITA, conversei com os professores, né, os meus professores, perguntando bom, como posso resolver esse problema. E eles, na época, me, me, me disseram, estude engenharia simultânea, concurrent engineering. Concurrent engineering era uma disciplina, uma abordagem razoavelmente nova, era de 1986, eu estava em 1994, né? 1991. Uh, 1990, 1991, aquela época, quando eu comecei o mestrado. E aí os professores Gonzaga e o professor Gregório, na época, me propuseram, então, faz um mestrado em engenharia, de, engenharia simultânea. 
Quando eu concluí o mestrado, meu objetivo era... Mas eu não estou satisfeito só com requisitos de manufatura, ou requisitos de montagem, ou requisitos de manutenção. Eu acho que está faltando alguma coisa. Eu fui para a Inglaterra com uma proposta de integrar os diversos requisitos ao longo do ciclo, do ciclo de vida. E fiquei com essa proposta lá, tentando trabalhar isso como integração de diversas ferramentas de engenharia simultânea. Até eu descobri, alguns anos depois, levou anos, 95, 96, pelo menos um ano levou para eu descobrir que o que eu estava querendo, a, a, a disciplina com a qual eu estava lidando, não era mais engenharia, engenharia simultânea, o concurrent engineering, era engenharia de sistemas. Ô, oh, Luiz, você prefere que eu fale em inglês? Todas as pessoas da palestra aqui falam português? É, Geilson, assim, a maioria, assim, esmagadora, sim. Nós temos um, uma pessoa inscrita da Estônia, ele não entende português. Os demais entendem português. No seu slide eu vi que está tudo em inglês. Is he então... there? Is he there? A Shia Gamble, please. Hello. So he's there. So I, I will speak in, in, in English, okay? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I won't tell again the story, but uh, so from 1996 onwards, I've been working on systems engineering. I was the first uh, Brazilian member of INCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering. 1996, as a student, and uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the story that I'll tell you this morning. So, uh, I will approach, I'll talk a little bit about systems engineering, then concurrent engineering, then an approach that I propose and the, the approach that I use to develop systems, uh, which, uh, which I call systems concurrent engineering, Then I will give you some examples on the team project and the CoralSat example. Then I will show a slide on verification validation, especially following the life cycle process uh, of a satellite, the tests that we do at LITI, and I will close with some conclusions. Then I will open to questions. So this is the definition that I use for systems engineering. O Systems Engineering is a multidisciplinary collaborative engineering approach to derive, develop, and verify a life cycle balance solution that meets stakeholder expectation. The words in red, this definition comes from the IEEE 1220, 1994, uh, which is uh, an inheritance from the MIUI standard. At that time, the MIUI standard, they stopped existing. And uh, some commercial standards on systems engineering uh, arrived. So systems engineering is multidisciplinary. So as far as I am dealing with a multidisciplinary problem, I can use systems engineering. When my problem can be solved by a discipline-specific approach, I don't need to use systems engineering. I may use other engineering skills, such as electronic engineering or mechanical engineering. Or So the idea is that systems engineering develop requirements to give to these other disciplines in order to, to develop the solution, okay? So as being, as something that is multidisciplinary, uh, it needs to be collaborative, so I need I cannot solve the problem with one, one person. So I, al I always say that one person is the perfect integrated development because all knowledge is, is, in, in, is, is in one only uh, repository. But um, when we have uh, uh, multidisciplinary problems, we need a team of people with different expertise. And the disciplines involved are not only the disciplines related to, uh, 
to electronics or mechanical or to product engineering. They are also related to soft issues and also to services engineering, like uh, sales, like uh, transportation, like um, manufacturing, assembly, etc. Also, systems engineering is not project management. It's not management. Systems engineering is engineering. Okay? I always say that. So, systems engineering provides the reference to be used by the project managers. They, are, they manage, they control the progress that, that is happening. They control the, the requirements, if the requirements are being implemented. They control the performance parameters, uh, things like that. And uh, what we do in systems engineering, we derive solutions, we develop solutions, we verify solutions. So verification is also part of systems engineering. So what we do here at LITI, the Laboratory of Integration Testing, is also systems engineering. So systems engineering is not only the con conception of the solution or the uh, uh, elaboration of uh, an architecture, a solution architecture. It is also the verification and validation process of, of the solution. Also, it is life cycle balance. So, in 1994, the definition of systems engineering already contained the life cycle word. So uh, we need to capture requirements from all over the life cycle in order to, during the development, during the systems engineering, we incorporate those requirements into the solution. And the solution be balanced. I, I, all, I always say that balance is key to systems engineering. So uh, some people say that systems engineering is the art of not satisfying uh, anyone. So no one will be fully satisfied. Uh, it is a solution. It doesn't say it's a product. It doesn't say it is an organization or a service. It's a solution that can be comprised by uh, hard and soft elements. And this, this solution must meet stakeholder expectations. In the original uh, definition, it included stakeholder expectation, it, it, it included user expectations and public acceptability. So the word stakeholder was used, uh, I included in the definition, because I think that would uh, incorporate, encompass all, all other stakeholders involved. So as I mentioned life cycle, uh, at the bottom you see a life cycle, uh, the, the uh, European Space Agency life cycle, uh, space product life cycle. So with the different phases from conception, um, with the going through the feasibility studies, then the design, uh, the preliminary design and the detailed design, then the production and qualification, what we do here at LIT, uh, then the operation and then the disposal. With many reviews uh, in between. So here's the traditional V of systems engineering. So, as you can see, we have uh, systems engineering on the architecture side, which includes the stakeholder requirements, the system requirements, the architectural design, the detailed design, but also it includes the verification side, which the unit acceptance, integrated subsystems, integrated system operational capability. So the, I, I always say that the difference between verification and validation is the reference that you use. If you are using uh, an engineered reference, it is verification. If you are using the real need, if you are comparing your solution to the real need, if you are testing the real environment, it is called uh, validation. So that's how I, I tell people 
uh, the difference between verification and validation. And you also see in, the, in this picture that we have the application of systems engineering to product, to system, to equipment, to hardware and software. As far as I have uh, systems, I can use systems engineering. What I advise to people is that when you have an electronic system, you may have, you may use systems engineering, of course, but you may have uh, skills in that discipline of, of electronic engineering that uh, is enough. You don't need to use systems engineering. So you capture the requirements and from the requirements on, you can use the discipline there. For example, if you are going to develop a a digital filter, so you know what is the signal that enter and what the signal that uh, needs to to leave the device. So you have to filter some picture, some some frequencies. So you have the requirement and you produce a result from there. So here is a little bit uh, to show you that requirements is everywhere in the systems engineering process. So we start with the stakeholder needs analysis. So everything starts from my statement of need. And I start to build a, a huge uh, requirements tree from that uh, statement of need. So the root of the requirements tree is statement of need. So the stakeholder needs analysis provides you with stakeholder requirements with uh, measures of effectiveness and a validation plan, concept of operations, system operational architecture. Uh, what is important here is that uh, stakeholder requirements are already engineering, engineering devices. So it goes through a requirements engineering process already. So you must value any information that comes from the stakeholder and transform that information into requirements. So the stakeholder shall be capable of doing something with a given uh, with a given constraint. Okay. So you have capabilities and constraints as stakeholder requirements. Uh, then you you the outputs of the stakeholder needs analysis the stakeholder requirements, the concept of operations, the system operation architecture, then you go through the system requirements analysis. I will tell you here that I'm not happy with only concept of operations, but the essential requirements, they come from there. We need to do a life cycle process analysis to have also the transportation concept the manufacturing concept, the integration concept, in case of satellites, the launching concept. So the concept of operations is a limited view that doesn't exploit all the potential of cost saving, for example, that I may have in developing a solution. The system operational architecture, it contains the physical elements that will actually perform the solution. Uh, and in there, I have the device that will be developed using systems engineering. So the output of the system requirements analysis is a set of functional requirements, which I call the essential functional architecture and other system requirements. For example, non-functional requirements. This uh, classification and functional and non-functional requirements, they come very much from software engineering and um, performance requirements, for example, are considered non-functional requirements. But we have other requirements, such as quality requirements, so such as other life cycle process requirements, manufacturability requirements, also environmental requirements, di dimensional requirements, things like that. Okay? These are these other system requirements. So that essential functional architecture and these other system requirements, they enter the architectural design. There I will identify which parts my subsystem may have and how these parts interact with one another. 
So I would I will, I start when I develop the system operational architecture. I start from a level above, a level of abstraction above. So if I will develop a satellite, I have to have a, new, a level of abstraction above. I have to know how the satellite will interact with the ground stations, will interact with the space environment, will interact with Earth, will interact with su the sun. I have to have this idea before developing the satellite. So what we do when uh, in the systems engineering process is to is going through an architectural design process where I will show how those functions will be addressed by uh, subsystems, for example, or other components. So that's how I get to a physical architecture, starting from a allocatable functional architecture. So then I will derive then lower level requirements. Then I get to the detailed design. The detailed design is the from a physical architecture and lower level requirements, I get to the requirements of the elements in the architecture. That's detailed design. Detailed design in systems engineering is not developing the CAD model of the, of the system. It's not uh, developing the drawing the board, the board, the printed circuit board. It's not like that. It's not detailed design when we talk about systems. Detailed design in systems is to produce the requirements for the next level. So the subsystem requirements are, are subsystem requirements are also uh, result of the detailed design process. So that's why I, that's why I say that the, the whole systems engineering process is, is the building of a huge uh, requirements engineering tool, requirements uh, tree. So that's uh, the message I tried to pass on to you until now. So systems engineering and requirements so we have uh, stakeholder requirements, system requirements, subsystem requirements, component requirements, and so on. In one side of the V, in the other side of the V, I, v, I have component test, integration test, system test, acceptance test. And every, every uh, life cycle is stage. In the other side of the V, so the tests, the verification, the validation process, they are planned when I do the requirements work, the architectural work. So I also, as part of the systems engineering process, the life cycle process consideration. So uh, at, each, at each part of, at each level of abstraction, I must run the systems engineering process and also do the verification and validation plan during this process. That's what this picture tells you. But look, so far we talked about operations, about tests. This is not enough. We must have uh, an, a life cycle process approach. So, and I have this opportunity when I do systems. So, uh, then I get to concurrent engineering. Concurrent engineering is an engineering approach that anticipates life cycle process requirements to the early stage of product development stages. I may call to the early stages of system develop, development stage. So this, um, I show you here, I show you an example of a life cycle uh, of a car, of a, a, an automobile. Uh, so. So you have the notion of what I mean by life cycle or life, life cycle process. Going from development, manufacturing, assembly, uh, testing, calibration, distribution, sales, use and service retirement. So here, how I connect then systems engineering and concurrent engineering. If you look at that uh, yellow picture there, that is the traditional systems engineering. So I have at the top 
the the system or this the satellite for example and i have a hierarchy of uh, of uh, components a hierarchy of subsystems and components to perform an operation only so if i if i use if i go through the systems engineering process which in the analysis dimension as you see there which in the ana analysis dimension if you go through the systems engineering process but if you consider the product and the services services are the organizations that implement life cycle processes if you consider that those things are part of the solution need to be developed in an integrated manner then you have concurrent engineering and systems engineering in the same framework and in, on the, and uh, on the right hand side of the picture you see the hierarchy from the the structure dimension from the mission layer up to the components to the system layer so uh, in traditional concurrent engineering it works at a very low level of abstraction a very detailed so i get for example a part of a car and i try to develop it um, uh, in, a, in such a way that is good for assembly for example so it works a very at a very low level traditionally so what i proposed and the way i do systems engineering is integrating systems and concurrent engineering and i call it uh, systems concurrent engineering so here is the process it's the method that is used so you start from the need and how you translate these needs into metrics how the, these metrics moes are how satisfied are the stakeholders it's a, a measure of stakeholder satisfaction it's not a measure of system performance it's different it's a measure of stakeholder satisfaction you have to ask them uh, how what they consider to be acceptable or not then you have the mission the mission is the capture of the essential requirements so you think of a satellite uh, orbiting the earth and also interact with the ground stations interact interacting with the the sun and the earth itself sending sending uh, receiving commands sending telemetries for example you imagine a car actually in operation so that's what i call a mission but then when you you have the, that system operation architecture there the solution that will uh that will include the, the satellite, for example, you have to choose which, which is the, the system of interest that you, are, that you are going to develop. So when you choose that, that system of interest will have life cycle processes. So you need to exploit their life cycle. So if I'm developing a satellite, I need to think that this satellite will be tested at Liti. We will have to undergo a vibration testing or a thermal vacuum testing. So I have to imagine that satellite in that, uh, in that environment later to anticipate all the, the products that will be also necessary, the enabling products to perform that activity. Okay? So when I think of the solution the car as a solution the car is only part of the solution the car interacts with the road with the traffic traffic system with other cars with the driver so this is the description of a mission but also the car goes to a to a to a gas station so i have to imagine the car in the gas station as well that's what i call life cycle process and we, you have to model that very early to capture also those requirements. These are what I call scenarios. So you have to imagine the car in the traffic, in the, when it's parked, when it's uh, on a very 
uh, high, high, high speed uh, road, very low speed road. You have also to imagine the car in the gas station or in the, in the garage, okay? You have to think of all those scenarios beforehand. Then you go to, you are going to investigate who are the stakeholder in each of those scenarios. You have a context of the system in that scenario, and you have also a physical context of the system in that scenario. What I tell you is that uh, sometimes you are responsible for developing the product and also the service, the life cycle process service. In that case, you should take advantage of integrated development. If you are not developing, for example, if I am uh, building an aircraft, uh, the maintenance of the aircraft is, uh, is to be delivered by other organization, then I won't develop that organization, but I still need to capture the requirements from that organization so that I incorporate in the solution. So from, uh, from that exercise, that the initial exercise, I have stakeholder requirements. From the product functional context, I will have circumstances, which are the, the states of the elements in the environment. So then I will derive initial modes. I always say, you may, you may split your problems into sub-problems. You don't have to build one solution for every problem. Maybe if you split your, your problem in modes, you develop a solution for each of those modes. And that may be done with products and also with organizations. So uh, with that uh, set of, uh, uh, with that effort, I get to system requirements. And from the system requirements, I develop the, the architecture. And the architecture is to identify the elements in, this, in that uh, satellite, in this case. But there are also, also elements in the organizations that will support the satellite life cycle. So for example, as I mentioned, I have to, to develop the satellite. So the satellite will have subsystems that I have to identify here. For example, power supply subsystems, telecommunication subsystems, the payloads. But I also have to think of, okay, this satellite will have to undergo vibration test. What's the adapter of the satellite with the vibration system? I have to think it beforehand, if I only think of the satellite, when I get to the point that I have to have the, the vibration test, I won't be ready, okay? I'll have to wait some time, to lose some time. Then I get to uh, 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 to uh, architectures, initially functional architectures, that start with essential functions, but then you add all the life cycle process derived uh, functions, then you get to the implementation or physical architecture. I use implement the word implementation because software is not physical. And uh, maybe organizations, it's hard to think of physical things. That's how, why I use uh, the word implementation. Then I get to a system architecture and a system detail design, which is to develop the requirements of the subsystems. So I'll give you some examples of why, uh, just to reinforce to you that I need a life cycle process of the solutions that, are, that we are developing today, even the, the product solutions, they themselves require a life cycle process approach. So this is the team project. We are part of that, the Telematics International Mission. We have contributors for, from five continents. It's a satellite formation composed of nine satellites. They can pro produce 3D images uh, from uh, uh, three satellites looking at the same point um, 
uh, on Earth. So we can have, it was motivated by that uh, uh, volcano in, the, in Iceland. So, uh, but for that, we have a formation flying, satellite formation flying, and you, ha you have to have inter-satellite control, and also you have to have uh, inter-satellite communication as well. But you have life cycle process issues related, very much related to the to product in that solution, which are, so traditionally, I would only think of concept of operations and a system operation architecture, as I mentioned to you. However, for this example, I would need to think beforehand, how do I produce this amount of satellites? I'm not talking here about uh, only nine, but you may have larger constellations of satellites that will require special production systems. The testing of satellites is very, you know, very one-of-a-kind approach. So how can I do it for a thousand, of, a, a thousand satellites? The testing architecture as well. How do I test the inter-satellite communication or the inter-satellite control? Uh, the launch. How do I launch? I have to, to know it beforehand. So the concept of operation is clearly not enough anymore. I need to do concept of other life cycle processes. Okay. Here we have the CorelSat example. CorelSat is a satellite to monitor the coral reefs. So uh, you, have, you have requirements. Here is just to show you that I, made, I can develop a product but also services at the same time using the same approach. So you have a need, that's the route to uh, the requirement tree uh, to monitor and map coral reef. We have here uh, uh, a system of operational architecture and I choose to develop the satellite. Okay? I would have some uh, measures of effectiveness derived from that need and I will get to a translation of those, uh, uh, when I put numbers in the measures of effectiveness, I get to a requirement or to a set of requirements. Here is the life cycle process. So I, I deploy down the, every life cycle process scenario and I, and I get uh, to the composition of those uh, life cycle process and I choose which of, life, which of those scenarios are part of my development effort and which ones are not part of the development effort. If they are part of my development effort, I should develop them in an integrated manner with the product. If they are not, I must capture requirements from them. So for example, if I choose the sensing scenario, I will start investigation, investigating the, the context of the satellite during the sensing process. What, which, which are the, the exchange of information, material and uh, um, information, material and energy between the elements in the environment and the satellite during sensing, okay? Also, I think, I may think of the circumstances. Maybe I have a uh, space weather problem here, uh, be the behavior of the sun. Maybe I may have um, uh, a space station, an uh, Earth station that's not operational. How do I deal with all these these things. So these are the circumstances and I have to deal with them maybe uh, considering some modes of operation. So he's just to show an example that we develop the satellite, the product, the satellite product, but we also develop the organization, the service, 
that is being provided all over the life cycle process. So then we get to the verification and validation stage. So what do I do here? So I, I, I chose some pictures that will show you the life of a satellite. So the satellite, this is the SACD Aquarius satellite, an Argentinian American satellite. Uh, it's, it was uh, developed with the participation of LITI. Here is the here is the vibration test. Why do I do vibration test? Because the satellite will be trans will, will will be transported to somewhere and will be launched to orbit. During launch or during transportation, it shakes, it vibrates, it undergoes accelerations, and it must resist to it. And I have to, to test it here on Earth. I cannot fix it later. So I have to submit the satellite to the same stages, to the same life cycle process of its real life. So here the satellite will, will vibrate then. I, I emulate here at least the conditions that a, sat a satellite will undergo during its life. During launch, the noise, the noise of the launch will may damage a satellite. So we have an acoustic chamber here that will submit the satellite to acoustic 155 decibels if necessary. This this chamber provides the provides the noise equivalent to uh, 30. Boeings, huge Boeings, uh, working um, at the same time, the turbines of uh, a huge aircraft um, working at the same time, uh, that, that sort of noise that is being... Uh, then, uh, when it's then in orbit, it was launched in orbit, it will undergo, uh, it will orbit Earth, and sometimes it will be very hot when it's towards the sun, and uh, sometimes it will be very cold when it, the satellite is hidden, uh, hidden uh, from the sun by the Earth. And uh, that's why we have uh, uh, thermal vacuum chambers, because it's orbiting the Earth, it goes through a temperature profile, but also in vacuum. So, that's why I need these thermal vacuum chambers, okay? Then the satellite is there, launched, and it is orbiting. It has to point accordingly to Earth. That's why I need to have mass properties measurements to see if the satellite meets those types of requirements, such as alignment, such as pointing towards. And also, we check if there is uh, interference, because any satellite is a sort of antenna in space. It receives, it receives uh, signals and it sends signals, and it's radio frequency. So I need to test in an environment that is very similar to space. So here is a shielded and anechoic chamber. These uh, panels that you see here, they are uh, anechoic panels. So in space, you don't have reflections apart from the, apart from the satellite itself. And you, also, you don't have disturbances as well. It's a very closed environment and very isolated environment. So that's why we, have, we need to have uh, uh, shielded and unequipped chambers to test those sort of requirements. So then I get to the conclusions that uh, systems engineering is about building a huge requirements tree uh, whose root is a statement of need. Concurrent engineering anticipates life cycle process requirements. The system concurrent engineering is actually a complexity management approach in which complexity may have, in which we try to, to solve 
complexity factors such as variety, such as connectedness, such as um, uh, tangled connections, the tangling of connections. And testing is with respect to requirements, emulating system life in order to verify and validation, validate by verification. The problem here is sometimes you have to test. Sometimes analysis is not, not enough to verify if the system meets the requirements. So I thank you very much for your attention and I ask you for if you have some questions. Thank you very much, Luiz. Thank you, Jailson. Great talk, very insightful. Thank you very much. So now we are going to open to the questions. So the audience can put your question in Portuguese or in English or in Spanish, whatever you want. If you want to open your microphone, just sign up in the chat box, please. Uh, okay, while we wait for, for questions, uh, I will ask you to put your vision or your opinion about the model-driven development, model-driven engineering in the context of assist engineering and required engineering. What's your opinion? Perhaps a new paradigm? I think, I think it's getting old already. I think we are late in Brazil, in that sense. But uh, what I think is that uh, everything I showed to you here, the process that uh, we go through the systems concurrent engineering process is actually doing done by models. What, I, what uh, bothers me is that that modeling effort must be translated into the, into, for example, information systems that will support the life cycle process. So if I, for example, will, will think of a, a satellite uh, during the uh, integration process, I must at the same time, I can do, because the effort that I will do thinking of the satellite during integration, the, the models that I will develop, they may be used for for becoming the, the, uh, a database design, you see? That is, a, uh, the effort must be integrated. Also, model-based systems engineering allows you to have reuse, the real. So we are really fighting right now for having small satellites to reduce costs. But what, what will give you cost reduction is to have reuse. If you have models, that is what you have. So if you want cost reduction, you must do model-based systems engineering because you'll be able to reuse those models to the, to the similar problems that you may have in the, you, are, you, may, you may try to solve in the, in the future. Uh, I think that now we must think of integrating models with the life cycle processes. So we must think of augmented reality, virtual reality, to, be, to make those models alive, to make those models really part of, uh, when you do the modeling, you are actually doing part of the solution already. What I mean, for example, I have a student here, she's doing the, her doctoral degree and she's trying to, to show that the models developed during the, product, the satellite develop, development will serve as a base for uh, the integration process information system. The models are there already. So that's how I see model basis engineering and how I see it is uh, evolving. It is something that uh, came to stay. When we have documents, you have, you have uh, encapsulated information. When you have models, you have information that can be connected to any other uh, information item. And that's the, the greatest part of uh, model-based engineering. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Julio Leite, please, you can put your question. Open your microphone. Ah, ok. Obrigado, Gilson, pela palestra, muito esclarecedora. E eu tenho uma pergunta. Nos, durante sua palestra, é, eu acho que mais de um slide, apareceu o V-Model. Né? O V-Model é um, um modelo que foi criado na Alemanha e é muito utilizado é, em engenharia de sistemas, principalmente na indústria automobilística. Mas, ao mesmo tempo, você menciona a engenharia concorrente. Né? E, a princípio, existe uma, uma inconsistência entre o V-Model e a engenharia concorrente. Eu gostaria que você é, esclarecesse um pouco para a gente isso, por favor. Quando eu uso o V-Model, é uma maneira de... Dealing with complexity, the focus of uh, the V model is recognize that the uh, system, the system is complex and have many layers of abstraction. Also, you the focus of it is to acknowledge that uh, everything you do on on um, one side of the V, you must verify in the other side of the V. When I I talk about concurrent engineering here, what I, what I really mean is that concurrent engineering is to consider that the life cycle process solutions are also systems. The organizations that are going to implement the life cycle process are also systems. And they, the, the, the whole solution is composed of elements of product and of organization. And as elements of pro process and organization, it will also follow a hierarchy that can be represented in, in the V model. I don't see any incompatibility between, uh, between V model and uh, concurrent engineering. But what I, I consider is that uh, the difference of my approach is that uh, the system solution is not only product solution it's also service solution or organization solution. So product and organizations must be, must be developed in, a, in a, such a, a integrated way in order to produce a good solution in terms of cost, in terms of time development, in terms of reducing, reducing uh, uh, loops. Of course, the V model is not only is not the only model of the systems engineering process. You have all other models such as the sequential models or or the uh, VW model or or the uh, the model that considers that I am developing uh, developing. Uh, for example, uh, an evolutionary model, uh, may, many other models. Uh, you may be talking about the loops that the requirements engineering require, but what I, what I try to, to, a message that I try to pass here is that you have, you, do, you have to anticipate thinking of your system at each stage of life cycle process so that you capture requirements very early, and then you, you test that requirement in the other side of the V. That's uh, what, I, why, what I mean. If you think of systems uh, just developing your operations, uh, finding a solution for your operations problem, then you have many loops later. The V will not be enough, because you have to, when you get to the life cycle process, you have to have a feedback. That's how I see. So the, the approach proposed here, that it is consistent with the, the V model, but is not concurrent engineering, traditional concurrent engineering. It's uh, concurrent engineering applied at every layer of uh, abstraction, not uh, the traditional concurrent engineering applied as design for assembly or design for manufacturing or design for maintenance. 
Okay, thank you. So we have another question. Ishaya Gambo uh, wants to ask you, uh, when building these requirements tree, do you have a target stakeholders to elicit the requirements from? And what approach do you use for eliciting these requirements? Well, there is no one approach to eliciting these requirements. What you have to, to have is an attitude towards the, the stakeholders. So you have to identify stakeholders or surrogate stakeholders and understand that it's your fault if he doesn't communicate his requirement. It's not his fault. You didn't ask the right question or you didn't uh, uh, understand enough his problem. So you have to value everything that the stakeholder tells you as something very precious. And that must be your attitude. Also, you have to understand that those requirements may change. It's part of the process. And of course, that's why you have baselines uh, in, in, in many parts of the system. But those baselines are only reference. They can also change. Of course, it go, undergoes a more a more uh, a more uh, rigorous process, but the requirements may change even after baselined. Let me read the. the okay. Yeah, you have to. You have to. If you have conflicting requirements, you have to try to solve them or to reach a, a compromise solution. That's the essence of systems engineering. I would say. I, I always uh, divide system engineering in terms of uh, systems management, systems analysis, and systems architecture. What I showed here to you is essentially systems architecture. So the systems analysis part of systems engineering is essentially trying to solve those conflicts. So uh, as I mentioned, the uh, systems engineering is the art of not, of not uh, making the stakeholder happy. So no one will be completely fully happy but we try to find compromise solutions. For example, I worked at Ford. They had a powertrain control system to be developed. So there were conflicting requirements there. The full economy, performance of the vehicle, and emissions, gas emissions, they were conflicting requirements. So you have to find a very near, very narrow opportunity, a very narrow window where you could take advantage of uh, the three of them try to have compromise solutions there. Okay, so Ishaya Gambo also wants to know if you think the V model still is in use and if you think the agile methodology can fit within the scope of system engineering from the perspective of software engineering. Oh, I think it is agile, agile methodology is much more uh, related to a spiral model, not the V model, but the spiral model, when you try to develop uh, very quick models of the solution. Very quickly, you model the solution to communicate it to the stakeholders and ask them, is it what you want? Is it what you want? And you try to do that in very, in very, uh, in very uh, in smaller cycles. So uh, I think the uh, agile, agile methodology may be within uh, uh, component development, or subsystem development, or system development. There's no uh, incompatibility with that. The, 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 if you have a, a high risk, a solution that you, you can't uh, figure out yet what to do, you, you may have to go through an agile, agile approach in order to communicate if what you are doing is actually what the stakeholder wants it, wants or needs. That's how I see it. Okay, very well. More questions? We have time for one more. Muito bem, so muito obrigado, Jailson pela palestra, muito interessante. Agradecemos muito pela sua participação. 
Foi um prazer tê-lo conosco aqui no, no ER edição 2020. Esperamos poder contar com você em próximas ocasiões. Bom, eu que agradeço a atenção de todos e as perguntas também, porque a gente sempre aprende muito, né? Essa é sempre uma oportunidade de aprendizado e de compartilhamento. Muito obrigado a todos.